so nice to be here. So nice to be here with Gurudev, Guruji, and all of you. It's like a pilgrimage coming here. Now for this program, all these talks, we're going to be using this book. There is a freedom for the teachers to use something else, but my hope is that people use this book because this is a wonderful, wonderful little book, Glimpses of a Divine Life. And uh, I was given first four chapters, like page, half a page, you know, just. I started to sort of summarize and write things in my own words, and I failed. Because it is written so beautifully, it's written so concisely, that it was very hard to put those things in my own words. So what I ended up doing is uh, basically copy per pertinent things from that and just compile them. These four parts that I have, there is an introduction, then there is living with goal and mission, then live to learn and live with humility. These are the things that uh, I'm going to try to cover very briefly. And I'm going to concentrate on living with goal and mission, which I thought was a very appropriate and important topic. So in the introduction, there is a beautiful poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. And departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. We can make our lives great too. And departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Beautiful, beautiful. In the introduction, Sri Guruji has written that one of the past presidents of India, Dr. Radhakrishnan, he had written that the history of India has saints and scriptures, not wars and emperors. History of India has saints and scriptures, not wars and emperors. And with that beautiful introduction, he says, one of such great saints of our time was none but our beloved Gurudev. Hariharanandaji. And uh, at the end of this, uh, the, but you know, the way Guruji has written, the great spiritual personality of our time, a realized yogi in the Kriya Yoga lineage, who lived among us and played his divine role for nearly a century, is none but our dear, dearly beloved Sri Gurudev Paramahansa Hariharananda. See the difference between what I said and what is written. The, immort the immortal lamp of his life and teachings inspires people from all walks of life, especially spiritual seekers. And in the last paragraph, says somebody, somebody had asked Mahatma Gandhiji, Gandhiji, what did you teaching? So his, and what is, what is the message that you give to the world and to us? Now his response was, my life is my message. There does not need to be a separate message. And how appropriate it is to look at Sri Gurudev and think about the life that he lived. Within Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna talks about uh, Sita pradnyasya ka bhasha samadhisthasya keshava sita bhi kim prabhasheta kima sita vajeta krim. So sita pradnyasya, one who is anchored in, ever anchored in wisdom, 
What are his signs? How does he walk? How does he sit? How does he speak? Now, Gurudev, Sri Gurudev, everything applies to him because Sri Gurudev just to see how he walked. It was as if he did not want to disturb the earth, Mother Earth. That's how gently he used to walk. You know, when he lived with us in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, we had an old rackety house, you know, it was a wood floor, and you know wood floors. One step you take on it, you know, and the whole house knows who is where. And Sri Gurudev used to take bath early in the morning, and then, uh, which we did not know. So we asked Baba, Baba, you want to use some sometime in the afternoon, Baba, you want to use the bathroom? Baba said, No, I get up at two o'clock. Then he showed us. Then I slow then I'm slowly going to the bathroom, slowly using the toilet. And I also take a bath. He says, I slowly open the tap and finish. My bath is done. Because we had a newborn baby in the house, so you know, he was that kind, considerate. This is his absorption. This is how he was in sthita prajna state. So this is what, uh, if you just observe his life, sitting with him to eat, you know, that used to be, a, every little thing was a lesson. So every little thing, there was a message. So sitting with him, he used to say, 200 times. We had two little girls, you know, so they used to go. <laughs> but that was being with him, and you cannot talk. You need to just concentrate on food. Obviously, the food is an offering to God. So this was Sri Gurudev's life. His entire life, if we understand his life, and that's why I think Sri Guruji took down every word that was uttered by him, and uh, he has written those four big volumes on his life. So this is Sri Gurudev. We come to living with a goal and a mission. It says, God is the creator and the creation. God is perfect, but we rarely see that perfection in us or around us. God is the creator and the creation. God is perfect, but we rarely see perfection in us or around us. So how to become perfect? When we are attuned to God, live in the presence of God, and unite with God. When we are attuned to God, live in the presence of God, and unite with God ultimately, then that, then only we see perfection within us as well as around us. Just within us is not enough. We need to see every living being, not just a human being is an incarnation of the divine. So that is the way to make life perfect. Now to have that, we need to have a goal and we need to clearly understand that. We need to have a mission, we need to have the big picture, and we need to live the life so that we walk towards it. Sri Guruji writes in that, inside the womb, every baby has a glimpse of the divine. Inside the womb, every baby has the glimpse of the divine. And praise to God to be born soon so it can love and serve God to attain perfection. I have to think over it. Every baby has the glimpse of God and the baby is praying so that it can be born. What is the purpose of taking birth? to serve God and ultimately attain perfection. Let's think about it. 
See, we say in Hinduism that once a person dies, the body dies. But the mind and all the karma goes with, with the person to the higher realm. And there, the person or the soul regains all the memory. He remembers why he or she remembers why he had taken the birth and what is next, what it needs to do. So that soul chooses the parents, chooses the place where it needs to be born so that that soul can get closer to that ultimate goal of attaining liberation, hopefully in the next life. That is why the baby in the mother's womb is, the, in, is God. They say that first two months, baby has recollection of the past prior births. And sometimes the way the baby behaves, you know, parents think it is erratic, but some of those memories, they linger and that's the expression of those memories during that early, early age. So that is why until that time, the baby is not baby, but baby is incarnation of the divine. Baby is God, baby is pure, baby is perfect. Then where do things go wrong? Where do things go wrong when the baby is perfect, baby has that perfection? <laughs> Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, he gave an answer to that. <laughs> He has, uh, I'm going to mess up if I read this uh, Bengali, <laughs> but, but I want to. But he says, Pancha Bhuter Pande Brahma Pade Kande. He says, trapped in the five elements, the Brahman is crying. Trapped in the five elements, the Brahman is crying. So the baby is Brahman, pure incarnation of the divine, pure presence of the divine. But these five elements, earth, water, earth, fire, earth, water, fire, air, space. Now, all of us Kriyavans, we can relate to that easily. You know, once we are born, we are born out of these five elements. We are comprised of those five elements. And what do they do? Earth, money, water, sex, fire, food, air, ego, and space, religion. Religion can trap us also. Along with that religion, there is spirituality which is liberating. But the religion, those limitations that have been imposed by others, not by those who created the religion, can trap us. So in those five elements, like we say in Kriya Yoga, is uh, money, sex, food, ego, basically the four lower elements, and fifth, the religion. They trap that soul and the body of five element is a trap, and the world is a trap. So that is how our essential nature, perception of who we really are, gets deluded as we start to live in this world. And the paths like Kriya Yoga or any spiritual paths, they guide us how to come out of that and walk the path of liberation and ultimately try to reach it There is a brief outline of uh, Gurudev's birth here and his uh, uh, family life. Sri Gurudev was born into a cultured and affluent Brahmin family on May 27, 1907, 116 years ago. In the village of Habibpur, Nadia district of Bengal, he was named Rabindranath Bhattacharya, mother Nabin Kali and father Haripad, had 11 children, five sons, six daughters. 
I think Sri Gurudev had one younger sister. Rabindranath was the youngest son in the ashram life in Puri, Odisha. He was first named Rabind Rabbi Narayan Brahmachari, and later, after the monk's initiation, his name was changed to Swami Hariharanandagiri. His, uh, in, his guru's picture is there who initiated him into sannyas. He was intelligent like his brothers, and he studied hard and earned the professional degree in textile engineering. He was aware of life's highest goal. We are talking about life's goal and mission. To reach realization, he created the burning desire within him to reach it. Now, talking about goals, there are different levels of goals. There are some goals which are small, Others are higher, and then, then we have the ultimate goal, which is common for all of us. And the examples is some student wants to study, so the immediate goal is to study and pass the exam. So one needs to, student needs to work hard for that one. Once we expand the horizon, you know, we say higher goal may be reducing the bad habits and cultivating good habits little higher goal, an ultimate goal is attain that liberation and attain that perfection. So the path of goal is like that. We cannot lose track of immediate goal if we want to walk this, uh, walk, take these steps in this life to reach the ultimate. All, all the time you cannot say, I'm just going to attain liberation. We have to live this life. We have these five elements. We are born like that. We have the theory of karma with us. You know, we, Considering all that, we have to take those steps and reach the ultimate, walk the ultimate path. Now, if that is the highest goal, there are always distractions from it. There's a little story that Sri Guruji has written about Baba Hariharanandaji. He was meditating. And during the meditation, he gets a thought that I need to read Bhagavad Gita. So he gets up, a noble thought, right? I need to read Bhagavad Gita. He gets up, gets the book, and then stops. Another thought comes. He said, what am I doing? I was meditating. Meditation is the path to reach liberation. And this thought, however noble it was, it is a distraction from walking that path. So he touches that Bhagavad Gita to his forehead, leaves it there, and sits for meditation. So when we decide, when, when that highest goal in life is clear to us, then nothing, absolutely nothing needs to come in the way. And then we reach, reach that higher, higher goal. We reach that liberation either in this life or in the next life, we don't know. But we need to walk the path. That is the most important thing. It is not that everyone can attain realization in this lifetime, but we should be aware of our divinity and our actions so we leave the world with greater development and fulfillment. Maybe not liberation, but we have improved ourselves. We are that closer to reaching the goal. That's how we need to live the life. Now, the next one is live to learn. To pursue the highest goal of life, which is realization, we need to adopt certain disciplines in our life. One such discipline is learning. Even Sri Gurudev, he was a constant student. He used to carry seven things with him, no matter where he was. He had the English pocket dictionary he had the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Chandi, the Upanishads, Holy Bible, an almanac, and a notebook. Sri Guruji has written that any time, any good thought that was expressed by anyone, 
Shri Gurudev used to write down, make a note in this notebook. Realize person, one needs to be a constant student because learning is essential on the path of realization. See, it is uh, when somebody asks, asks us, hey, do you know such and such thing? A lot of people would say, oh, yes, 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 I know, whether, whether they know it or not. That I know comes from the ego. It is only because when we fall prey to ego, we are suppressing the opportunity to learn. Just imagine when somebody asks us something and we really do not know. And if we open up and honestly say, no, I do not know that. That I do not know that the simple sentence opens the doors to learning, experiencing something that we do not know, enriching our life, giving us tools to walk on the path of realization. So learning is very, very important. And to learn, one needs to be humble. So that is why live with humility is the last thing that uh, that's part of my talk in here. So learning is important. And along with learning, these are like uh, uh, two twin brothers. And there's an example. It says, the tree loaded with fruit bends down. Examples all around this ashram, you know, all these mango trees you see, that they're drooping down, almost touching the ground. A tree loaded with fruit bends down. A person with knowledge is always humble. A dried stick and a fool break. A dried stick and a fool break because they never bend. Humility is not for show, it is a reflection of inner change and progress. Need to remember that. There are people, you know, who show outwardly, they show they're very, they, they're very humble. But it, you cannot act humi humility. It has to be born from within, from the actions that you are taking, from the thoughts that you're thinking, that creates your personality, and humility is born out of that. So we need to live a life with a certain lifestyle that makes us humble. Not say that I'm, I'm say get up in the morning and say I'm humble and I'm going to walk, act like that. No, that needs to be inherent within us. Because uh, those of us who have, uh, have been fortunate to uh, spend some time with Sri Gurudev, you know, every letter that he used to write, he used to write humble, Hari Harananda, humble Hari Harananda. So this is the significance of humility. So these are the four chapters. I'm going to concentrate on uh, living with a mission. And the thought came that uh, living with a mission and living with a goal, I had read this another book. Shri Guruji has written, The Divine Quest. It talks about uh, Gurudev's early life, Gurudev's ashram life. So Gurudev's ashram life, you know, as sweet as he was that we have seen, he had really gone through a ringer when he went to the ashram. See, Guru, Shri Gurudev took uh, initiation from Shri Yukteswarji when Gurudev was 25 years old. And then after initiation, Sri Gurudev used to work at that time. He was a uh, graduate. He had graduated in textile engineering. He had a very good job close to Puri. And he used to go to Sirampur ashram. So every moment he got after work, he used to spend it with his uh, uh, guru. So he used to go to Sri. Yukteswarji, he used to serve Sri Yukteswarji, he used to take care of him, and his humble behavior and his sweetness, Sri Yukteswarji was really taken by it. So if at any time he would be late going to Sri Rampura ashram there, then he used to ask Prabhuji, uh, Swami Narayan Giri, that where is, where is Rabindranath? Where is Rabindranath? Where is Rabindranath? So, you know, he used to, if uh, 
Gurudev would walk in late, so Prabhuji used to go, where have you been? Gurudev is asking about you. He says, you are late, you are late, you are delayed. So it used to make him feel good that uh, I may be doing something right. That's why my, my Gurudev is waiting for me. So he served him. He took, took care of him. It was uh, Sri Yukteswarji was in his advanced age. He used to be sick at that time, so he used to wash him, he used to take care of him, he used to uh, serve him very, very, very lovingly. So this was the life he had, and then uh, Sri Yukteswarji asked him, he said, uh, you need to move into Karar Ashram. Sri Gurudev was not really receptive to that. He knew his goal, he was aware of his goal, and he knew living in the ashram, would, he would be attained that goal quickly. But this is how the material life is. See, seeing the background of uh, Sri Gurudev's life, he was brought up in a beautiful joint family. All the brothers, sisters, parents, cousins, they all lived together. It was a huge, very big family. And there was a lot of love. There was, no, uh, there was no disagreement in that family because that's the way parents brought them up. So it was a beautiful life, but it was all living together. When he started to work and he started to earn money, then he had some freedom at that time. And that freedom, he started to enjoy that freedom. He had, uh, he used to wear trousers and shirt, coat, and he used to have a hat also. But this is all his outer wares. You know, his uh, personality was still the same. His thirst for liberation was still alive, still there. Other things living in the material world may have given him all these outer, outer things of comfort, but his heart still was yearning for that. So he was in... Uh, little two-minded state, you know, whether I should go or whether I should. Then only thing that he used to think that going there, I'm going to lose my freedom. That freedom that he was enjoying, he said, so that's why he started to go to Sri Yukteswarji. Sri Yukteswarji said, then you need to move into the ashram. So he rented a house close to Karar Ashram, and he used to visit Karar Ashram. But this was going on for a while, and then in uh, 1936, that's when Sri Yukteswarji took Mahasamadhi. And then the desire to go into the ashram was becoming really strong. But he still took Sri Gurudev another two years before he moved into the ashram. He moved into the ashram, but he still had his job. So he was, see the attraction of this material life and these comforts. They are, they, are, they are very strong. So he had still kept his job and he was taking extended leaves. And then at one day, he said, this is not good. I need to cut that, uh, cut that cord. So he had even kept his old clothes. Then he said, I would give them away to somebody. Then he said that if I give them away to somebody, some, I'm going to create a desire in that person's heart person's mind. So he said, no, I should not do that. I should not cut up somebody else. So he burnt all those previous possessions that he had. He said, this is liberation. That is, this is the color, that red color clothes I would be wearing. So he renounced all that. He went away from that and he totally dedicated himself to the ashram life. Rabbi Narayan Brahmachari, uh, Brahmachari Rabin, that's what they used to call him there. Coming from this loving family, coming from this environment of, uh, environment supportive of spirituality, religion, and then the life that he had in the ashram, we all fantasize about ashram life. But Sri Gurudev was the prime example of how much hard it was. 
right starting with the person in charge of the ashram, Swami Sevananda Ji. He said, you cannot live in the ashram like that. You will have to pay money. He said, I came, renounced everything to come to the ashram so that I can serve, serve here. But he had money because he had work. So he said, okay, I will pay. So he started his ashram life as a paying guest. He lived there. He had come from a very affluent family. In that ashram, there was no... Uh, people used to take bath open. He was not used to that. So he requested uh, Swami Sevananda Ji, can I build a bathroom that everybody can use? He said, you're going to pay for it? He said, yes, I will. He said, okay, you can do it. So he built a little bathroom there. Shivananda Ji was very strict. It is very unusual for Sri Gurudev to say that anybody was rude and angry. But these are his words. His description of the person in charge of the ashram, Swami Sevananda Ji, he was a rude and angry man. But that's the way he lived. He lived life like that. Now, living there, there was no guidance as such. You go to the ashram, we sit here, we have uh, satsang, we have meditation. There was no group meditation. There was no teaching. Everybody, all the people living in the ashram, they were on their own. So it was, he had to create his own schedule because there was a lot of work, a lot of seva in the ashram, and he never said no to any, any of the seva. So first, when he went there, he saw the ashram grounds. Ashram grounds was a sand hill. A sand hill overgrown with thorny bushes and thorny weeds. You could not even walk there. So he hired people with his own money. Hired some laborers, bought them shoes, and then they, so that they could walk around, asked them to pull all those weeds and pull all those uh, uh, thorny bushes to clear the ground. The ashram, there was no compound wall or the property wall. So all the stray dogs, cows, they used to roam, roam around there. Sri Yukteswarji Samadhi Mandir, it was not a Samadhi Mandir, it was just a thatched roof over the place where, where he was buried. So cows used to go there, dogs used to go there, and that entire ground was infested with snakes. So it was very hard to even go out in that area. So Gurudev worked hard along with these people and he cleared the ground. He started to plant uh, bushes, flowers, <clears throat> and he got the property wall built there. Now it was conducive to meditation, it was peaceful, and everybody enjoyed that. Started to live life like that. Now, even in here, when Sri Gurudev moved into this ashram, he said, if the tree does not give fruit or flower, cut it down. So there were two trees. They were like oriental needle trees, you know, tall. And those trees, they were not giving fruits, they were not giving any flowers. So, Brahmachari Rabin cut those things down. Swami Shivananda was not in the ashram at that time. When he came back, he saw that the trees were gone. He knew exactly who had done that. He called Brahmachari Ravin and he says, who do you think you are? You are the owner of this ashram? Who gave you permission to cut these trees? Brahmachari Ravin was feeling very bad. It, still, his expression was not of retaliation. He said, oh God, what was I thinking? I should not have done that. I should have asked his permission. That's humility. So he, he said, I made a mistake. What can I do? He said, you go to the nursery right now. The nursery was about a mile away. He said, you buy two big bushes similar to this and plant them there. Until that time, you will not get any food. So in the sun, Brahmachari Ravin walked one mile, carried those two bushes on his shoulders, 
brought them back, planted them, and then he was given food. Talk about hard life. Talk about sitting for meditation without getting any thoughts. All these adversities that he had to face in that ashram, they were going to have reward at the end, but walking that path was very thorny, just like the thorny bushes and the thorny weeds that were in the ashram. Now next he had, uh, he wanted to build, he saw that thatch roof over his guru's samadhi mandir. So he wanted to build a mandir. So he had written to Yogananda ji. And Yogananda ji wrote to him and wrote to Yogananda ji's brother, Gorda. He says that, uh, yes, this is a good idea. Build, an, uh, build the samadhi mandir there. And he gave a design also. So with Yogananda ji's brother and uh, uh, Brahmachari Rabin, they planned the whole thing and built a beautiful, beautiful uh, samadhi temple there in the ashram. And in 1974, I had the opportunity to go to the go to go to Karar ashram. And now that I read about how the ashram was, I realized that that truly was heaven on earth. Even now, it is not as good as I had seen it because the original meditation hall was intact. Now I think it is split into rooms, except for the wall where all the pictures of the gurus, uh, gurus used to be. But this is the place where they all meditated. Uh, Yogananda ji meditated, Baba meditated. Anyway, but this is, uh, this is how Gurudev's Brahmachari Rabin started to improve the grounds planted beautiful uh, plants. When I saw them, there were beautiful roses all over the place there. And the Samadhi Mandir, you know, you go sit there. Baba had taken me there and then uh, asked me, you sit and meditate there. So he gave me time to sit and meditate. The ashram looks incredibly beautiful. So that is how slowly, 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 he changed, changed the ashram improved the ashram. Let me see if I'm uh, missing any points in here. There is a, there's a story about uh, Ananda Mahima. When Rabindranath used to work as a textile engineer. And you know, he used to wear those trousers and coat and a hat. But his desire to see all the uh, divine personalities was still same as the way his upbringing was. So when Anandamai was, Ma was coming, she had her main ashram in Varanasi and she had ashram in Puri. So, and when uh, Ravindranath heard that, you know, he went to see Anandamai Ma. And when she saw him, when wearing those clothes and uh, Gurudev's fair complexion, he used to look like a European. So Anandamai Ma saw him, he says, my Sahib Baba, Sahib Baba. So Sahib, you know, usually in India, we call them for Europeans or those with fair skins. And it says Sahib Baba. So that was the name Anandamai Ma had given to him. And then she, Baba used to, uh, Rabindranath used to go see her and she used to give him guidance, advice. So she came after some time and that time Rabindranath had already moved into the Karar Ashram. So she asked, where is my Sahib Baba? So somebody told him, was told her that he has moved into the Karar Ashram. So she, along with other mothers, you know, they were there. So all of them, they went into the Ashram and Ananda Mema, God intoxicated all the time. So she just went in there shouting loudly, my Sahib Baba, my Sahib Baba, my Sahib Baba. Sevanandaji did not know who Ananda Mahima was. So he thought she was a mad person. And she, he did not know who Sahib Baba was. So that confirmed that this is a mad, mad mother. Who has, so he screamed at her. He said, no, 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 get out of here. There is no Sahib Baba here. And who are you? 
all this commotion, Baba was meditating in uh, seclusion in the room. He heard it. So he quickly came out. He was observing silence. Quickly came out, touched Anandamaya's feet, then other people came out and the other ashramites, you know, they knew who Anandamaya Ma was. Then somebody mentioned to uh, Swami Shaivanandaji that this is Anandamaya Ma. So he apologized to her. And uh, Gurudev also sat with sat with her and she, Gurudev wrote, he had written that every time I saw Ananda Mahima, she would give me advice to improve my meditation and all those, uh, all that advice was very useful for me. So that is how in that ashram, meeting with Ananda Mahima was also a problem for him. <laughs> this is how tough the life was in there. There was, a, there was a rule in the ashram that was established by Sri Yukteswarji. Sri Yukteswarji used to be very frugal. So he said, day is for working and for meditation, and night is for sleeping and for meditation. There is no need to burn oil lamp. So there was no oil lamp allowed in the ashram. So Brahmachari Ravin used to do all the work, seva, a task that he had assigned to himself as well as what was required in the ashram. He used to complete all that and then he would go and sit for meditation and late into the night he used to meditate. Swami Satyanandaji used to be in the Rachi ashram, in the school there. So whenever he used to visit in the evening, he used to take a walk around the ashram and he used to see. So he used to always notice Brahmachari Rabin is meditating. So while walking, he used to uh, call him out. He says, Brahmachari ji, go to sleep. You need to take care of your body. So that's, uh, that's how much love even Sa Swami Satyananda ji had for him. Eventually what happened, that Paramahansa Yogananda ji got to know how uh, what kind of behaviors uh, Swami Shaivananda ji had and how Brahmachari Rabin was uh, working in the ashram. So he wrote a letter to uh, Brahmachari Rabin, asked him to take charge and he also wrote a letter to uh, Swami Shaivananda ji and it is written that Swami Shaivananda ji went to Rachi Ashram and he stayed there for a short period of time. Then he went on a pilgrimage and ultimately in Haridwar, he uh, stayed in the Bholagiri Ashram. And uh, Baba Hariharanandaji at that time went and visited with him to pay respects. Now talking about this uh, burning lamps and no light, you know, there's a story about that. There's one disciple that uh, Baba Hariharananda ji had initiated. He used to work, he was an electrical engineer and he used to work for the State Department of uh, uh, Electricity. They used to provide electricity to the whole town. So he came and he, he used to sit and complain. He used to say that every time there is a time for an employee review, and promotion, they used to uh, pass me over. I have never gotten promotion. So Baba said, uh, you bring your astrological chart and let me check. So he saw that and he saw where the problem was and he gave him a mantra to chant. So he chanted the mantra and within few weeks it's written that he started to see the change in the behavior of the superiors and he was immediately given a promotion and not only he was given a promotion but it was made retroactive and he was given two years worth of back pay. So he was, this electrical engineer was overwhelmed. He came, touched Baba's feet, he says, Baba, I don't know what miracle you have done but this is what has happened. Please allow me to do one seva. He said, what is it? He said, let me bring electricity to the ashram. Baba said, oh no. He said, my guru has said that there is no 
oil lamp in here, live alone the electricity, you will bring electricity, who is going to pay the bill every month? He said, Baba, allow me to take care of all that, but please let me bring electricity. And that's how the entire ashram was uh, lit. You know. He brought the electricity there. So this is how Baba's, Baba started to work there with love, with uh, taking care of everybody and run, running a beautiful ashram. So everybody used to be happy and slowly, slowly, slowly people started to see the change that in the way the ashram was run, the way the food, even the lunch used to be just rice and whatever green vegetable that was grown in there. There was no, there was no, dal was a luxury it was written. Having a dal once in a while was a luxury in that ashram. And uh, usually people used to have mashed potatoes, you know, that's a norm there. There were no potatoes in here. So once in a while they will have that. So Baba slowly, slowly changed that, you know. He changed that, but to change that, he had requested uh, Paramahansa Yogananda Ji to send some money. And Baba's brother used to send money to the ashram so that Baba could do all these things. So this was the life of service. This was the life of dedication. And the whole thing was driven by only one mission, liberation, realization. So the path of liberation, uh, realization, we can talk a lot that this is a short term goal, medium goal, and then the ultimate goal. But to walk that path is not easy. And we can see how much Baba had, uh, how much hardship Baba had gone through. But those of us, we have seen him, you know, there was not a trace of that bitterness. There, there was not a trace of anger in there. It's just sweetness. Just uh, a small story that I have narrated uh, in the past. You know, in, in, we, we had gone to New York and uh, there was initiation at that time. And our two girls were there. And they were very little, they four and eight, and they were uh, sleeping in the living room. We were all sleeping in the living room, and the initiation was supposed to be in the, in the living room. So I was trying to wake them up. I said, come on, get up, get up, get up. And little children, you know, they don't want to get up, they want to sleep. So I, my voice was going up. I said, come on, initiation is going to start in 10 minutes. You're still lying, you gotta get up, brush your teeth breakfast. So when my voice started to go up, Baba came out of the room slowly. I didn't even notice that he had come, you know, and then he went and the girls were sleeping on the floor. So he went, slept in between them, <laughs> puts his hands under their head and he said, get up with joy, get up with joy. And the girls woke up giggling. But that's love, that's caring, that's compassion. He was uh, not just Thita Pradya, not just a uh, symbol of wisdom. He had that sweetness in him. He had that charm in him. He had that caring in him. He had that sympathy in him. He was, he was a true master. That's how he brought that every flower that I saw in the ashram, First, I, it was very hard for me to believe that in the sand, Baba was growing all these beautiful roses. It was like every rose was smiling with his smile. It was a beautiful ex experience at that time.